Hey, I'm Dr. Morales. I'm a cardiac electrophysiologist and I have treated thousands of patients with atrial fibrillation over the years. I also created the channel Dr. AFib where I create videos like this where I really just help people kind of living with atrial fibrillation, help them overcome symptoms and understand their treatment options. But this particular video is my A to Z video. I'm really going to discuss everything somebody needs to know about atrial fibrillation in this one video. So I'm going to cover everything from A to Z. This is something that people have been asking for for a while now. Do everything that you need to know about atrial fibrillation in one video. And that's what I'm going to do in this video. So it's going to be a longer video. I'm going to go over a lot of topics, but it's really everything you really need to know about atrial fibrillation in this one video. And I'm going to give you a little bit of my insights about what I do with my own patients after treating thousands of patients with atrial fibrillation over the years. So I'm going to discuss what is atrial fibrillation, what causes it, what triggers it, how atrial fibrillation progresses, how atrial fibrillation is treated all the way from medications to procedures as well as maybe future directions for atrial fibrillation. So I hope you can find this video very beneficial. If you like this video, if you want to see more of my videos for atrial fibrillation, please check out my channel Dr. AFib and click that subscribe button that's underneath this video right now so you can be alerted when I create new videos. But with that said, let's get started with talking about atrial fibrillation from A to Z. First step is what is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is the most common irregular heart rhythm. It affects over 5 million people in the United States and over 30 million people across the globe. It is the most common heart rhythm issue by far and it's only getting more and more people are being diagnosed with this condition. So what happens in atrial fibrillation? What is it exactly? So let me get a little heart model here. So the way I explain it to my patients is atrial fibrillation comes from your atria. This is a heart model that has been opened up. So you open it up and look at the inside. The atria are the upper portion of your heart. Okay, the bottom chambers are called the ventricles. So in the upper chambers of the heart, the atria normally beat in unison. That's the regular heartbeat. It beats in unison, transfers blood over to the lower chamber of the heart. But in atrial fibrillation, fibrillation means that it's going very fast and very irregular. That's what the word term fibrillation comes from. So instead of the upper chambers of the heart, instead of beating like unison together like this, it's just kind of fibrillating. The multiple areas are beating at the same time. I like to give people the comparison of you're in a room full of people and everybody's talking at the same time and you can't make sense of anything, you know, and that's sort of what's happening during atrial fibrillation. Multiple areas in that upper chamber of the heart are just beating all together at the same time in a very, very rapid and irregular chaotic way with no uniform, unif uniform contraction whatsoever. So that's what's happening when it's fibrillating, okay? And so what happens when it's fibrillating is that the blood is not being transferred to the bottom chamber of the heart or the ventricles as efficiently as, as it usually is. Uh, you lose some of that squeezing phenomenon coming from the upper chambers of the heart. In addition, it tends to make the heart go very fast as well. It is not uncommon to have heart rates that are over 100 beats per minute, sometimes 120, 150, sometimes even close to 200 beats per minute because the heart rate is so erratic and so irregular and it tends to make the heart go very fast. So that is what actually is happening during atrial fibrillation. But why does this happen? Atrial fibrillation is the most increasing heart condition. It's actually one that's getting more and more people are having it. But why is that happening? And so that leads to the second thing on my list is what causes atrial fibrillation. So what are the main causes of it? So big picture, um, there are a few things that we do really understand about what causes atrial fibrillation. There's a lot of things that we don't understand, such as the genetic aspect of it. There's a lot of things that are still yet to be understood instead from the genes in terms of what genetically may contribute to it. But there's some big risk factors that very commonly a lot of people have. Number one is age. Uh, people as they start getting older, 60s, 70s, 80 years old, they have a significant increase in the amount of people who have AFib to the point when uh, people start reaching close to 80 years old, there's close to 10% of people who have atrial fibrillation will start getting close to 80 years old. And why is that? It's because of a condition known as age-related fibrosis. Age-related fibrosis means as people get older, they develop 
scar tissue in their heart. Uh, I frequently tell my patients it's not uncommon to when somebody ages and they start getting wrinkles on their skin. Kind of similar. Um, you get this increased scarring in the upper chambers of your heart and that ends up leading to increasing risk for getting atrial fibrillation. So that's age. What other things can cause atrial fibrillation? Another big risk factor is having past heart disease history. What does that mean? So if you've had a heart attack in the past, you've had a heart valve problem in the past, particularly the mitral valve, which is the one that's closest to that atrium that I pointed to earlier, um, those heart valve problems can increase your risk for getting atrial fibrillation, as well as another heart condition called congestive heart failure, sometimes called a weak heart or a stiff heart. So all those ultimate conditions affect the long-term prognosis of your heart. What does that mean? So the medical therapy for all these heart disease has gotten so well, people are living longer than ever before. There's many people who have had a heart attack and they're still alive doing great 20 years later, but then there's the after effects of previous heart problems. So whether you've had a heart attack, stents in your heart, bypass surgery, there is some long-term damage that has been done to your heart that can lead to the scarring and increase that fibrosis that I mentioned before in your heart, which ultimately leads to episodes of atrial fibrillation. So it's good that people are surviving other heart problems and living longer, but it's also leading to increasing number who are having episodes of atrial fibrillation. In addition, there's also chronic health conditions uh, which contribute to other types of heart disease which have also been influenced with atrial fibrillation. Number one would be high blood pressure. High blood pressure causes all sorts of heart problems, whether that's weakening the heart muscle, risk of heart attacks, as well as risk for atrial fibrillation. Uh, high blood pressure, especially when it's not controlled, increases the pressure inside of your heart, especially in that left upper chamber, which is where AFib mostly comes from, and that increases the risk for getting atrial fibrillation. So does diabetes, another chronic condition that many people live with that also affects many other elements of heart disease. Diabetes can increase risks of scarring in your heart tissue and ultimately lead to episodes of atrial fibrillation, even if it's well controlled with medications. Obviously, when it comes to high blood pressure or diabetes, the worse it's controlled, meaning if the control is not very good and your diabetes or high blood pressure, blood pressure are poorly controlled, that risk of having AFib is going to be higher than if it's well controlled with other medications or diet or something like that. Other things that also can cause AFib is obesity. Well, obesity by itself, when it's been studied, has shown that but has also increased risk for atrial fibrillation. Some of that is also the increased risk of scarring inside your heart. But then also the people who are more obese tend to have more fat tissue around the heart itself. And the fat tissue called adipose tissue that's around the heart has been known to secrete hormones, which increases the risk for scarring as well as atrial fibrillation as well. Um, and then another risk factor would be alcohol. Alcohol has been a significant risk factor for a lot of people that get AFib. Uh, clearly, you know, significant alcohol like alcoholism, when you really have binge drinking daily, significant alcohol usage is a very clear risk factor for getting AFib. But then also even that regular daily drinking, like, hey, I have a glass or two of wine every day with my meal. It's not a big deal. But when you do that every day for decades at a time, yeah, that increases the risk for atrial fibrillation. And the last major cause for atrial fibrillation is what's called uh, sleep apnea. It's a sleep-related disorder where people stop breathing when they're asleep, usually for a few seconds at a time, but your oxygen levels can go low during that period. And it usually will happen many, many times, sometimes even 100 times a night uh, when people are sleeping. And so you get your oxygen levels going up and down while somebody's sleeping, and that stress can lead to stress on your heart. The low oxygen levels can increase stress to your heart and lead to, again, more scar tissue and cause that uh, episodes of atrial fibrillation. So those are sort of the main causes of atrial fibrillation, but there's also things that we don't understand. I mean, there's people who have, who have told me that I don't have any of those risk factors, yet I still got AFib as well. Um, so there are certainly some elements that we don't completely understand, but at the same time, those are the most common uh, risk factors and applies to quite a lot of people. And as you maybe hear from the list that I had, there's a lot of interplay. There's a lot of people who have multiple of those conditions. And a lot of it is related to obesity probably is a big risk factor for a lot of people because obesity increases your risk for high blood pressure, for diabetes, for sleep apnea, and also for having heart attacks or blocked his artery heart. And all these things put together increases your risk for AFib. And so those are sort of the main causes that people get atrial fibrillation. Now, I want to distinguish that with a different thing called triggers. So those are what causes it. Big picture when you're asking 
why did I get AFib? Those are the common risk factors of why somebody got it. Now, what are triggers? What does that mean? Triggers means what might set off an individual event of atrial fibrillation. So this is for somebody who already has AFib. You want to know what might be setting you off, what might br bring out an episode for you. And that's, so that's what triggers are. So it's a, a little bit different than the big picture of what causes people to have atrial fibrillation. So triggers are something that are very important for people to identify because that may actually improve your symptoms and reduce the amount of episodes that you're having. Uh, triggers can vary very much from person to person. So it's not the same thing for everybody has to do this one thing. I've had thousands of patients with disease and some people will clearly say it's this, some people will clearly say it's that, and if there's no quite variability or consistent thing. It's just really what it sets it off in, in you and you have to be a little bit of a detective to figure out what most sets it off in, in you. So probably let's go over a few common triggers for atrial fibrillation. Number one would be fatigue and sleep deprivation. Um, I've had countless people tell me that if they don't sleep good or they've had a several nights in a row for a bad sleep, uh, that sets off episodes of atrial fibrillation. And that can come for a lot of reasons. That can be one, just the fatigue by itself. You didn't sleep well. Uh, two, when people are very tired you probably have maybe have more caffeine usage uh, than before and then the increased caffeine usage might lead you to be more dehydrated so it's kind of a bad cycle which goes back to the poor sleep status or being sleep deprived uh, another thing that can trigger atrial fibrillation would be illness uh, people when they have a history of atrial fibrillation and they get sick for a variety of reasons whether they get a pneumonia they get a cold or a flu an upper respiratory infection, you get a, a stomach bug, you get an infection on your leg. You know, being sick gives your body like a heightened stress level inside your body, which can then set off atrial fibrillation. I've had countless patients in the hospital, they come in showing up for pneumonia, for example, they're getting treatment for it, but then AFib shows up while they're in the hospital for pneumonia. So it's very common that you get ill, uh, especially if it's a more severe illness, that you it may set off an episode of atrial fibrillation. A third thing could would be stress. Uh, stress by itself um, can affect atrial fibrillation. Uh, some people, when they get really stressed out, the blood pressure goes high, and it may, that by itself might set off an atrial fibrillation. But I always tell my patients, it's not always just the stress by itself, but it's how you respond to that stress, which can set off or trigger episodes of atrial fibrillation. Number one of ways that people respond to stress well maybe you don't sleep as well which goes back to my fatigue issue maybe you are drinking more coffee because you're tired maybe you're drinking more alcohol because you're stressed out about things or maybe you're stress eating you know stress eating is never healthy food you know it's usually uh, junk food and so that stress eating uh, may increase your sugar may increase your blood pressure all those together may affect or trigger episodes of atrial fibrillation a number uh, another one would be dehydration by itself dehydration can happen for a variety of reasons again excess caffeine can do it excess alcohol can use it do it um, excess exercise especially when it's hot or humid outside just the heat by itself if you're not staying well hydrated those can all set off episodes of, of atrial fibrillation so dehydration is an important thing to try to minimize if you have a history of, of atrial fibrillation obviously alcohol usage by itself can, can be a trigger for a lot of people um, there's sig obviously significant alcohol usage like if you get drunk you have multiple drinks chances are either when you're drunk or the next day when you're getting more hungover you know and dehydrated you're going to get episodes of atrial fibrillation some people will say even just at one glass may trigger that for them that's why it's an individualized thing not everybody responds the same way but some people even a small amount of alcohol can trigger off episodes of atrial fibrillation but certainly significant uh, episodes can certainly cause that there's something called holiday heart syndrome, which it describes an increased incidence of atrial fibrillation for people uh, around the times of holidays or vacations. And usually it's because there's so much associated significant alcohol usage during those periods. And so definitely watching your alcohol intake is uh, certainly uh, uh, very important. Um, and those sort of covers the main triggers of what causes uh, atrial fibrillation. If you have other things that trigger your atrial fibrillation, put the comments on, uh, underneath this video. So let's talk next about how atrial fibrillation naturally progresses and then we'll talk about the risks of atrial fibrillation especially if it's uncontrolled so atrial fibrillation is a disease that progresses uh, it goes in stages it starts off less severe then it kind of progresses and gets worse and worse over time 
especially if nothing is done. You know, I always tell my patients, like, we can stop that progression if we do something, whether that's medications, procedures, lifestyle modification, we can stop this progression, but the natural history that it will continue to progress. So it comes in stages. First stage would be called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation means that AFib comes and goes. You're not an AFib all the time. And this is sort of how it usually starts. By definition, these episodes usually last less than 48 hours. That's not a cold and hard uh, definition, but that's kind of the usual timeline definition if you ever look up paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. They usually stop on their own. Okay? People who have proximity fibrillation and nothing is done about it and your risk factors don't change, those episodes will become more and more frequent. So when people first get episodes of AFib, they may have episodes that are months or even years apart. And then they start becoming more frequent. Uh, and then they start lasting a little bit longer. And then it reaches to a point where it doesn't want to stop on its own. And that's what's called persistent atrial fibrillation. Persistent atrial fibrillation is people who have been in continuous atrial fibrillation for at least 48 hours or continuously for uh, up to uh, one week. Okay. Um, so this is basically means that you're in AFib all the time and it just doesn't really want to stop on its own. Uh, in these earlier stages of persistent AFib, meaning you haven't had it that long, there's still a chance that it can stop on its own, but sometimes it requires some level of medical intervention, whether that is medications or even sometimes procedures to get somebody out of atrial fibrillation. Next step stage would be long-standing atrial fibrillation. Um, people has been over for several weeks up to one year. Uh, that is long-standing atrial fibrillation. We're still in continuous AFib for uh, over one year. And then there's very long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation where you've been in atrial fibrillation for over one year, constantly hasn't stopped for over one year. Then there's a last term called chronic atrial fibrillation. That's kind of more of a clinical diagnosis. That's where the doctor as well as the patient have decided together that there's going to be no plans to bring somebody back out of atrial fibrillation to normal sinus rhythm. And the plan is just to keep them in atrial fibrillation and control them medically. So sort of, sort of the, the definitions of how atrial fibrillation progresses. Why does that matter? Well, it affects treatment. It affects the success of treatment. The longer, the more somebody progresses down that road of atrial fibrillation, the longer that they have had atrial fibrillation, the lower the success rates of getting you out of atrial fibrillation. So most treatments for atrial fibrillation work the best when somebody has paroxysmal AFib, when it comes and goes, or when they have had persistent atrial fibrillation when it has not lasted that long. Uh, when somebody has had atrial fibrillation constantly and it's maybe been less than a year or so, you can still get pretty reasonable success rate with tactics to get you out of AFib, um, whether that's cardioversions or ablation procedures, things to get you out of AFib, can still have a reasonable success rate if you've not had persistent AFib for over one year. But once you start reaching after one year, you've had it for over a year, the longer those years go by, whether that's one year, two years, going over to five to ten years, the longer somebody is at AFib, the lower that success rate to get somebody out of AFib. Uh, why does that happen? Well, the AFib uh, affects the heart even in a chemical, biological, molecular level. Even the kind of signals inside of the heart change uh, the more people have uh, atrial fibrillation. Uh, the way the heart conducts in, is changes when the longer people have atrial fibrillation. In addition, that upper chamber of the heart, uh, the more people have atrial fibrillation, it gets bigger and bigger and dilated. Uh, it gets more scar tissue in there. And I can look at people's ultrasounds of the hearts and say, people, um, they probably have had atrial fib for a long time just because those chambers have increased and dilated uh, so much. So as the years go by, the success rate of getting somebody out of atrial fibrillation becomes lower and lower. And so it's really important if the, for somebody's goal if to be not in atrial fibrillation anymore, the sooner that action is taken, whether that's with medications or procedures or lifestyle modifications, earlier it's taken, the better the success rate and the better the chances of reversing atrial fibrillation. So that's a very important key point to understand is the progression of atrial fibrillation and why it's super duper important to take action as early as possible after you have been diagnosed. So what are the risks of atrial fibrillation? I told you that AFib gets worse and worse. So what are the main risks of atrial fibrillation? So number one risk of atrial fibrillation would be risk of stroke. That is the number one most dangerous thing, the most disabling thing, the worst thing about having atrial fibrillation is the risk of stroke. Although people have 
severe symptoms with atrial fibrillation, the risk of stroke is the number one most uh, disabling thing which can cause permanent dis disabling uh, symptoms afterwards with the overnight with the stroke. People with atrial fibrillation are over five times more likely to have a stroke than people who do not have atrial fibrillation. But the risk of stroke is very individualized, so it's very important to understand your particular risk of stroke. Not everybody's risk of stroke is the same. My risk of stroke would not be the same as somebody who is 80 years old, for example. Uh, so there's a the main ways which your doctor kind of figures out your individual risk of stroke or calculates your risk of stroke. That is something called the CHADS VASC risk score. The CHADS VASC risk score is the most commonly used risk scoring system for atrial fibrillation across the world. It has multiple points. The words CHADS VASC all stand for something and they give you a point, either one point or two points depending on the letter, and that tells your doctor your overall risk of stroke and what are the better treatment options to reduce that risk of stroke. So C stands for congestive heart failure. If you have CHF, that gives you one point. If you have H stands for hypertension, uh, if you, even if it's well controlled on medication, that also gives you one point. Two, the first A is for age greater than 75. Age greater than 75 is a very strong risk factor for having a stroke from atrial fibrillation. So that one actually gives you two points if you have an age over 75. Uh, D is for diabetes. Again, even if it's well controlled on medications, you get one point for that. Uh, S it's for past history for stroke. So if you've had a stroke in the past, whether that's a major stroke or even a mini stroke, what's called a TIA, uh, that actually gives you two points. And so that's another one that's a higher risk factor because if you've had a stroke before, the risk of having yet another stroke becomes even higher. So you get two points if you've had a stroke in the past. Moving on to the other letters, V stands for vascular disease. If you've had vascular disease in the past, meaning you've had a stent in your heart, you've had a heart attack, maybe you've had blockages in the arteries of your leg that needed to be fixed, or known blockages in the arteries of your neck that needed to be fixed, that gives you one additional point of risk factor for stroke. The second A is for age 65 to 74. In that age range, you only get one point because it does increase risk of stroke, but not as high being as over age 75. So that would give you one point. And the last one is SC. Uh, it stands for sex category. Uh, women uh, have get one more point as well uh, over, over men. That's actually a little bit of a controversial part of it. Um, back years ago, uh, uh, women were more likely to need blood thinners than men just because of that added point. But the, the way the interpretation of the scoring system has changed over the years, that more currently, if you are a man, if you had a score of two or higher uh, then it's stronger blood thinners recommended to reduce risk of stroke but if you are a woman a score of three or higher is recommended to take stronger blood thinners so the interpretation has changed a little bit because uh, it wasn't very clear if the sex category woman versus female really had a huge impact on risk of stroke so that's risk of stroke so stroke risk management is absolutely essential for anybody with atrial fibrillation, whether you've had an ablation, whether you've had on medications. Stroke risk reduction is an essential part of the long-term treatment of atrial fibrillation, no matter what other treatment options you do. What are the other risks for atrial fibrillation? Other risks would be damaging the heart or causing what's called heart failure. Heart failure is a weakening of the heart muscle. And this can usually happen for people who are one, AFib all the time, and two, it is not well controlled. So people, when if their average heart rate is fast all the time, uh, it's not well controlled over a period of several weeks, even several months, it can cause objective weakening of the heart muscle itself, that lower chamber of the heart becomes weaker, and it leads to congestive heart failure, cause shortness, causing shortness of breath, and, and, and it may be something that's not even able to be corrected in some cases. If it's detected early, getting somebody out of AFib can improve the strengthening uh, of the function of the heart muscle, but it needs to be identified early and get somebody out of atrial fibrillation. So those are sort of the main risk factors of developing AFib, which would be the risk of stroke as well as the risk of permanent damage to your heart muscle. All right, so let's talk about treatment for atrial fibrillation. So again, treatment for atrial fibrillation has very different aspects of it. There's number one, which is stroke risk reduction, absolutely essential, but it's separate from treating the symptoms of atrial fibrillation. Symptoms of atrial fibrillation are kind of treated in different ways. And so I'm going to say it's like two hands. You have to treat them both different uh, separately. Okay. Let's first talk about stroke risk reduction. Okay. Atrial fibrillation, as I mentioned before, rapidly increases risk of stroke from 
for most people, the main risk of stroke comes from a little area in the heart. And I'm going to bring a little heart model in here. Uh, if you look at this heart model here, there's a little pocket in the left upper chamber of your heart called the appendage. This is a bit exaggerated in this model here. Uh, it's a little pocket on the side. Uh, blood becomes very stagnant there when people have atrial fibrillation. The blood clot can form there, and that's where the main risk of stroke really comes from. And so the main treatment for reducing that uh, risk of blood clot in that area is with blood thinning medication for the grand majority of people. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that CHADS VAS risk score is really the main way in which your doctor can decide uh, what is the best treatment option for you and whether you need to take strong blood thinning medication to reduce that risk of stroke. And for the grand majority of people with atrial fibrillation, most people are going to need to be on stronger blood thinning medication because they work very well. They work very well to reduce risk of stroke. They help reduce risk of stroke in general, usually around 60 to 70 percent stroke risk reduction. Um, lighter blood thinners like aspirin uh, reduce the risk of stroke by less than 10 percent. Uh, natural blood thinners are even weaker in terms of their blood thinning effect than an aspirin is. So really prescription blood thinning medication, which these days the most common ones used are Eliquis and Xarelto, uh, Pradaxa. Uh, those are probably the most common ones used. There's another newer blood thinner called Cervesa. And the one that's been around for a very long time is called Warfarin. Uh, Warfarin has been around for well over 50 years. Um, and it, it was sort of the uh, standard for stroke risk reduction for atrial fibrillation until these newer blood thinners uh, came out several years ago. And they've become more of the uh, standard of care because they've reliably reduced um, risk of stroke and have reliable blood thinning effects. So that's for stroke risk reduction. A lot of people are going to end up needing these medications, unfortunately, but it really takes dramatically reduces the major risk of atrial fibrillation, which is risk of stroke. Let's talk about treating symptoms of atrial fibrillation. So there's two kind of big categories. There's rate control and there's rhythm control. Rate control is for controlling the heart rate to prevent it from going too fast. Uh, rate control, the most common used medications will be called in the category of what's called beta blockers. Uh, they kind of slow the heart rate down, specifically a certain uh, uh, receptors in the heart called beta receptors. They slow the heart rate down. The most common one used is metoprolol, but there's many other ones. Uh, other ones include atenolol, carvedilol, uh, propranolol, uh, labetalol. There's several of them. Uh, they slow the heart rate down and they can also help prevent episodes of the atrial fibrillation as well. They have a bit of an anti-adrenaline effect uh, and they can help prevent episodes as well as well as reduce the heart rate when somebody is in atrial fibrillation as well. Another category of rate controlling medication includes uh, calcium channel blockers. Uh, the most commonly used would be deltiazem or verapamil. Uh, those also work in, to slow the heart rate down. Uh, they work a slightly different mechanism than the uh, beta blockers, uh, but they can slow heart rate down and prevent episodes of atrial fibrillation. Let's talk about rhythm control medications. Those are specific rhythm control medications that work more on the electrical properties in the heart, such as the sodium channels, the potassium channels, and to help. They're a little bit more specific than atrial fibrillation, but they all also have a little bit more restrictions and they have a little more risks or, and side effects as well. So they're not to be taken lightly and they're to be make sure they're prescribed in the correct air, uh, patients. Um, well, some of the most commonly used antirhythmic medications include uh, flecainide uh, as well as propafenone, sotolol, Multac. Uh, those are commonly used, and those are more commonly used in people who don't have other heart problems. You know, they have, um, they don't never had a heart attack before. The overall heart function looks okay, and they can be overall safe in the long-term usage, but they do need to be monitored closely. Uh, another commonly used antiarrhythmic medication is amiodarone. Amiodarone can be used in pretty much anybody, uh, whether you have a weak heart, whether you've had a heart attack in the past. It can be used very frequently, especially in the hospital setting because it has intravenous forms as well as pill forms. It can work well, but it also has the biggest list of side effects. It can cause thyroid problems, eye problems, lung problems, especially with chronic long-term usage. I use it quite frequently, but just for short-term usage, particularly in the hospital setting, I use it a lot. But then in the long-term goal, try to get the people off of it once they're out of the hospital. Okay, so those are antiarrhythmic medications. Uh, what about procedures? Uh, procedures are very common treatment options for when it comes to atrial fibrillation. Uh, let's first talk about cardioversions. Cardioversions are designed for people who are in constant AFib all the time. Uh, so if your AFib comes and goes, then a cardioversion is not something that would be an option for you. 
prefer. If you're an AFib all the time, a cardioversion can be an option. It's a relatively simple, straightforward thing to do. A cardioversion is an electrical shock to the heart. When I, you know, it's kind of like you see in TV in the movies when they paddle somebody's chest and they try to bring somebody back to life. Same thing, but a lot less dramatic than that. Uh, in a cardioversion, patients are usually asleep. I usually always use an anesthesiologist so the patient doesn't feel anything. And when the person is asleep, I try to shock their heart to bring them back to a normal rhythm, okay? Usually only takes a few minutes to do. Uh, the main risk of doing a cardioversion is doing it if you have a blood clot inside of your heart. And why it's important to check for a blood clot uh, before a cardioversion. That can be done in a variety of ways. It can be done with a CAT scan. It can do, be done with an ultrasound. Uh, there are a variety of ways to check for a blood clot before the actual shock is performed. Um, in addition, somebody who's been on blood thinners for a consistent amount of period of time, like well over six weeks, usually doesn't require any testing uh, beforehand, and I can just go ahead and be, and be shocked. Uh, so that's a simple thing to do, but it may not work. That's sort of the, side, the, the bad downside of doing a cardioversion. It's a simple thing to do, quick thing to do. People recover and go home very quickly, but it may not work, okay? And the longer somebody has atrial fibrillation, again, going back to what I said before, the less likely that shock is going to work, but it's certainly, in my opinion, always fair to try. It's a simple thing to try with a low uh, risk factor to it. So that would be cardioversion. Um, after that, what are more aggressive things that can be done to help control atrial fibrillation, especially for these symptoms of atrial fibrillation? The next step up, in my opinion, is what's called a catheter ablation procedure. A catheter ablation procedure is a procedure that I do and other electrophysiologists do, where we enter in through a needle puncture just usually inside of your veins, take catheters that go up to your heart. People, when they get episodes of atrial fibrillation, they come again from your atria, which are the top portions of your heart, specifically in the back of that left upper chamber of your heart, where my fingers are right here, right over here. Uh, there are these four veins that go from your lungs back to your heart. They're called the pulmonary veins. They have extensions of heart muscles and nerves in them. This is where most people's AFib comes from. Uh, you can imagine this is sort of the short circuit area, the misfire area that kind of sets off episodes of atrial fibrillation. So in an ablation procedure, go, I go into their groin and take a catheter over to their heart. Uh, I typically use a burning catheter, so to kind of make it very simple, I, it's, described, it's called radio frequency, but I describe it as a burning energy. A burning energy makes strategic burn marks around these veins like here, and another area right, right around here, okay? Other energies can be used as well. Freezing energy is commonly used as well, but I particularly use burning energy primarily the, uh, these days. Um, procedures itself usually take uh, less than two hours to do, and I send most people home the, the same day of the procedure. Um, that works much better than any cardioversion does. Uh, you can get that whether you're in AFib or not in AFib, uh, and it can be a, definitely a good long-term procedure and it really helps reduce symptoms of atrial fibrillation. Again, when it comes to procedures for AFib, the less time somebody has AFib, the better the success, sorry, the better the success rate. The, if somebody has proximal AFib where it comes and goes and they're not in AFib all the time, they're at the higher spectrum for success with an ablation procedure as well. Um, there are people who need ablations done more than once to get really good success rate. Uh, people who are in AFib constantly all the time, their success rate is going to be lower from an ablation procedure and they're much more likely to need more than one procedure to get really, really good control over, over atrial fibrillation. Going further down their line, there's also surgical ablation procedures. There's surgical ablation procedures called a, a mini maze is a common one. Uh, there's another one called a maze procedure. And then there's also another one called a convergent procedure, which is a hybrid between a mini maze as well as a catheter ablation procedure. These are certainly more aggressive ablation strategies. They certainly can be more beneficial uh, in, in people who are more advanced in their atrial fibrillation because it's all just a more aggressive procedure. In a mini maze procedure, for example, there's several incisions performed on the lateral sides of their chest and ablations performed on the outside surface of, of their heart. Um, people usually end up needing to stay in the hospital several days and there's a longer recovery time. So again, can be beneficial for people who have more advanced AFib or perhaps they have failed the traditional ablation procedure, uh, but it is, a much, it is definitely a riskier procedure uh, and a longer re recovery time, okay? Another procedure that can be helpful sometimes for atrial fibrillation is a pacemaker. A pacemaker can help control the heart rate. It doesn't cure AFib. A lot of people ask me questions like, can a pacemaker by itself just fix AFib? No, but it can be a useful element to help 
control aphid. It can control the heart rate, uh, help you tolerate uh, medications uh, as well. So it can be a useful element. Uh, the last procedure to discuss about is actually more for stroke risk reduction, and that is the Watchman procedure. The Watchman procedure is designed for people who need to be on blood thinning medication like uh, the Eliquis Zarelto that I discussed previously, but you can't tolerate it. Um, you know, you either have legitimate bleeding problems, you've had anemia or bleeding your stomach or stool, maybe you have a fall risk, you're kind of unsteady on your gait, you've had falling episodes in the past, where it really wouldn't be safe for you to take a strong blood thinning medication. So in a watch and procedure, people are usually asleep, that's a needle puncture again, get inside your groin, take catheters that go up to your heart. This is a demo that has a watch in it. It's kind of where I discussed before where the main risk of stroke come from in this left upper chamber of your heart right here. And then the watch is this plug which goes in this area right here which is deployed through a catheter. Comes in several different sizes. When I'm happy with the overall position of it, I let it go and it stays in place. Uh, this works just as well as being on strong blood thinners to reduce risk of stroke. It's been studied in many clinical trials, but without having all the risks of the strong blood thinning medication. So I'm, I'm quite a fan of Watchman procedures. I think a, a lot of people uh, can benefit from, the, from this procedure as well because it, a lot of people just can't tolerate the really strong blood thinning medication. Lastly, an important thing, I couldn't have any discussion about each relation without discussing lifestyle modifications because they are absolutely essential in the long-term management of atrial fibrillation. No matter what strategy you get to improve symptoms of atrial fibrillation, whether that is medications, you get a cardioversion, you get an ablation procedure, you get a mini maze surgery, no matter what that strategy is, the chances are AFib will probably come back again at some point if what's caused the atrial fibrillation has not been addressed. So going back to what causes the atrial fibrillation, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, all these things, if they're not properly addressed, chances are the AFib will come back no matter what strategy is, which is, means lifestyle modifications are absolutely essential no matter what strategy you get. And there have been several clinical trials that have shown that whether it's a cardioversion, whether that's an ablation procedure, whether that's medications, the long-term successor when you start looking years down the road is much better if you include lifestyle modifications to co control the origins of why people got AFib in the first place. Several studies have looked primarily at diet and weight loss and have shown that that has been an essential portion of the long-term management of atrial fibrillation. Alcohol cessation, if it's a significant risk factor for you, if it contributed a lot to you getting AFib, needs to be cut out and significantly uh, reduced. Weight loss, controlling high blood pressure, controlling diabetes, treating any sleep problems like sleep apnea. If you don't get back to what caused atrial fibrillation to begin with, it'll just keep coming. It'll just keep coming. So you got to get healthier and you've got to uh, go back to the origins of what's causing the AFib. Several studies have shown that people can actually reverse AFib. Just by itself. Uh, people who have AFib, especially when they're in the earlier stages where it comes and goes or you haven't had AFib for that long, just lifestyle modifications by themselves can work just as well as any medications or procedures can. On. And so that includes things such as losing weight, improving blood pressure, improving diabetes, removing artificial ingredients, removing, uh, trying to control added sugar, added sodium, excess alcohol, all these things together, living a healthier lifestyle can also improve symptoms of atrial fibrillation. And that's sort of why I created the Take Control of AFib program. The Take Control of AFib program is the step-by-step -step plan that I created to help people everything that they need that involves natural treatment to help improve symptoms of atrial fibrillation. So you get a full meal plan and you get all sorts of tips from me, guidance from me of how to implement this into your life for better long-term results. And so it's been very helpful for a lot of people for atrial fibrillation. Right underneath this video, there'll be a link on the to this video where you can learn more about the program itself as well as see testimonials from people who have actually signed up for the program. So check it out because no matter what direction you go with your AFib treatment, lifestyle modifications are absolutely essential. Uh, so what's coming down the road for atrial fibrillation? So that's the last thing to talk about, future directions. What's next? You know, is there something new coming down the pipeline? Um, as far as medications, unfortunately there haven't been new medications in a long time. Uh, the, the newest medications were 
newer blood thinning medications, um, and there has been a while since they came out. Medications to reduce or suppress AFib, there hasn't been a new one come out in a long time. Uh, there have been a lot of advancements in the procedure side of things. Uh, there's a lot of uh, procedures, um, the equipment that's used for procedures, it advances all the time. I tell people the procedures, the the equipment that I use to do my ablation procedures changes every year like iPhone. So they make it more efficient, a better, a quicker procedure, and improve the success rate of, of, of the procedures. So that certainly is beneficial. There's also alternative energies that are being uh, researched to do the same kind of strategy to create that strategic scar to ablate tissues in your heart, but using different energy sources to see what works better. Uh, there's been also been freezing energy that's been around for a long time. There's even uh, new RNGs called PFAs, which are under clinical trials right now, they definitely have some encouraging uh, results. Uh, so there are newer things coming down in the procedural side of things, uh, which I think could be very beneficial for a lot of patients and definitely could help improve symptoms. But in my opinion, a lot of these improvements, these advancements will help, but it all goes back to what I just said, going back to what caused your atrial fibrillation. No matter what uh, strategy you get, whatever new or emerging technology you get, um, is gonna it's gonna keep coming back if you don't get back to what caused atrial fibrillation, which again goes back to lifestyle modifications. And again, I created a step-by-step -step program, the Take Control of AFib program that we link underneath this video. I also think that have been changed a lot is our ability to detect AFib. You know, we're part of the reason why so many more people are getting AFib is because our ability to detect it is just getting better and better and better. Um, there's a lot of in office things that doctors can prescribe, whether that's heart monitors, there's even these little tiny little patches that you can put on your chest, which can continuously monitor your heart rate. Um, there's even little implantable uh, heart monitors, which are about the size of a paper tip clip, called implantable cardiac monitors that you put underneath your skin. They can last for several years and are always tracking their people's uh, heart rhythm to see if there's any signs of atrial fibrillation, as well as how often people have an atrial fibrillation. They're very, very accurate devices. But in addition, there's also at-home monitors as well, which are constantly new products coming out. Uh, one of my favorites is called the CardioMobile device. CardioMobile is smaller than a, a credit card. It's, you just put your thumbs on there, uh, and it takes a picture of your heartbeat and your heart rhythm, and it tells you if you're an AFib or not. But there's also many options now. Apple Watch does it as well. Fitbit does it as well, and there's, there's just constantly new products coming out. So our ability to track and monitor AFib is certainly in, increasing and getting better and better. So that is my atrial fibrillation from A to Z lecture. I just said a lot, but if you go through this whole lecture, you're going to know everything that you need to know about atrial fibrillation. If you want to know more, there will also be links to my book as well, my book over on Amazon where you can get ebook as well as a paperback. Again, tells a lot of what I discussed here, but it's your complete A to Z guide and everything you need to know about atrial fibrillation. Otherwise, I wish you the best with your heart health and your atrial fibrillation.